All right. <clears throat> can everybody hear me okay? I don't think my mic's on. Mike, Mike, anybody? There we go. Can you hear me now? You got me? Okay. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started here with um, our post-race press conferences. We've now been joined by our race-winning crew chief, Matt Sordinsky. I don't think I pronounced that perfectly, but okay. Go ahead and say your last name, though, so they know exactly how it's pronounced. Swiderski. Thank you, Swiderski. We'll work Squid. on that. I will work on that before we see you again in this um, <clears throat> format here. But obviously, Daniel won the Am Better Health 400 today at Land Motor Speedway. Three wide finish. Congratulations. Um, this is your third Cup Series win from the crew chief position, but the first one with this team and this organization. Tell us a little bit about um, your view from the pit box and, and really what it means to go ahead and get the 99 in victory lane so early in the season. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I knew that going to track house eventually we'd, we'd win together. Um, I didn't know it would happen this quickly, but um, you know, we were on pit road repairing damage on lap two, so uh, just incredibly proud of, of the group of people that we have put together at track house and able to recover from that and uh, be in the position to win and, and then actually execute the win. All right, we'll go ahead for questions. I know we have a few. We'll go ahead and get started. We will start with Jim Utter and then go to Bob. Jim Utter, motorsport.com. Uh, congratulations, Matt. Two questions. One, could you take us a little bit about how you got from lap two accident into position to win, and then a little bit about how you saw the last lap develop. Yeah, so, um, I mean, we were barely settled in on the pit box when we were going straight into damage repair mode. Um, and the first time we repaired the damage, the tape started flying up and um, had to get some more pictures of it and come up with another plan and had to work on it again at the stage. But uh, everybody kept their, kept their heads in it and stayed calm and um, were able to get the car back to where we felt we were pretty decent and could be competitive. Um, as far as the, the final lap, uh, we'd been, uh, we'd been taking time with uh, Frankie, our spotter, and Daniel and myself each week to review film. And we watched the whole race together in the same room so we can talk about it, talk about different moves. So. Uh, it's something that I knew Frankie knew how to coach him through, and so I was able to kind of just sit back and, and enjoy it and watch and uh, felt like it was going to be really close, which it was, and uh, glad we came out on top. All right. Bob? Bob Pop, Chris Fox Sports. What does this win, you think, do for Daniel? I mean, you talk about a guy who, you know, seems like there's so many drivers at, at track house and a lot of people felt like he needed to win and not just and not on a road course to maybe prove him himself yeah thank you um so this year coming in and starting to work with daniel he's been extremely confident um and very positive about this year um so i think he believed that we would get here um, but to get this out of the way early um i think it allows him to relax a little bit but uh, really start to focus on the playoffs. So it's huge for him. It's huge for the whole team. Um, I think it, you know, proves to him if he had any doubts in the back of his head, back of his head that he didn't belong, those should all be gone now because he he definitely belongs and he can run with these guys. All right, Lee. Lee Spencer, CatchFence.com. I talked to Ross in Victory Lane after the race, and he said that. Daniel never gave up last year. He just kept working, and he outworked him, and he worked so hard that it made Ross want to work harder. Do you get that sense that they just push each other, you know, one does well and then pushes the other, and it's just making the whole organization better? Absolutely. It's, uh, it's impressive across all levels how um, between Phil and myself at the crew chief level or Daniel and Ross at the driver level or all the engineers uh, continually push each other. Um, but, you know, there's no secrets between any of, of the teams. Everybody works, works together, shares all the information. And it's, uh, it's really impressive to see uh, how, how well they work together and how they continue to push each other forward. All right, our next question will go to, go up from here to Jacob and then Jonathan. Jacob Zillman, Race Face Digital. Matt, uh, you've worked with a handful of drivers, had a couple of wins I know before with AJ. What has the dynamic been like or how has it been different for you working with Daniel than some of the other guys you've worked with um, 
in Cup when you were at Colleg? Um, so I spent a lot of time with AJ, so Daniel's definitely more calm. Um, I'm sure at some point he will yell at me, uh, but so far we, we haven't had that yet. But um, I've just been really impressed with how hard Daniel works, how he, he really focuses on his craft. Um, when we have our meetings every week or go to the simulator, he comes in prepared, he has questions. Um, it's just really impressive. He, he really wants to be at the top of this series and, and puts in the effort to get there. All right, Jonathan, go ahead. John, the VL, the racing experts, you know, drivers are talking about changing conditions, a lot of, you know, air moving in the pack. What was it like, I mean, just on the box, the challenge of trying to keep up with all that? Yeah, the, uh, I mean, one of the big challenges is uh, it was so different if you were out front versus uh, back in 20th or so, um, and knowing that the way the race, the race cycle, then you would spend time uh, flip-flopped one way or the other. It's really tough to, to find the balance for both. So that was the challenge to, uh, to make sure we had the balance right at the end. Um, with all the fuel-only stops and, uh, and such, you don't have a whole lot of opportunities to work on it, even being a 400-mile race. Um, so just being uh, precise on the, the few changes we had to make sure that if we were out front at the end, the balance would be what he needed was the challenge. All right, our next question will go to Dustin Long and Matt Weaver, and then Charles will get you a mic as well. Dustin Long, NBC Sports. I don't want to take away from this moment, uh, but obviously they don't. The, the sport doesn't stop. There's another race in a week. Um, because the super speedway racing is so hard to kind of tell things, what are you curious to see starting next week at Las Vegas once, um, and I'm going to say the real season begins, but you get a little bit more of a better handle of things? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a weird year having these back-to-back -back super speedway kind of unique races. So uh, with the Fords and Toyotas having updates this year, it, I mean, we're, we're all curious to see what we have when we unload it. Um, at Vegas, and then when we go to Phoenix and have a, a new aero package to work with, that's a, another curveball for us. So um, right now, nobody really knows what they have. So uh, you know, we've been spending a lot of time on the simulator working through it. But it, until we get some real life data, it, it's uh, we'll all find out together on lap one, I guess. All right, Matt. Matt Weaver, Sports Not. Uh, I'm curious, like in the 30 or 40 seconds that NASCAR took to formally make the decision. Timing and scoring showed that you guys won. So did you know, or what was that 40 second period like for you? Um, I saw on TV and time and scoring that we had won. So I, was, I wasn't gonna accept anything different. I was convinced myself. Um, when they showed the first slow motion videos, it started to come up. I started to get a little bit of doubt and the angle they had it, it didn't look great. Um, but when they finally uh, froze it there and showed, I, I felt fairly confident that we had it. So. Um, I don't know why. Sometimes I'm a bit of a pessimist, so I w I'm surprised that I was optimistic that we won that one. And then one more for me. Um, in talking to all the other guys who were involved in that finish, every single one of them added at one point, I'm so happy for Daniel. And what have you noticed in working with Daniel that makes everyone, even rival teams, kind of root for him? Uh, I think two main reasons. One is he's an uh, incredibly nice guy. He's, he's friendly with everybody. He's, I think he's well-liked around the garage. and. Um, and then number two, I think everybody sees the work he's putting in. Um, and you know, from, from their perspective, people like when they see that hard work pays off. So I think that's the, uh, the added uh, benefit to his personality that everybody seems to uh, latch on to. All right, Charles, go ahead. Charles, what with Associated Press, you, admit, you mentioned uh, having to go into immediate damage control and then take some pictures and formulate a plan. What was the damage and, and what was the difference in the car after you were able to get back into it after the stage? Uh, so the biggest issue we had that we were working on is the, uh, the hood was bent up around the uh, radiator exit ducts. Um, so we were working on trying to seal that and then try to seal the hood back down to the uh, fender tops. Um, we believe that there could have been a little bit of splitter damage, but from the pictures we saw, that seemed to be pretty minor. So our main focus was uh, to fix everything on the hood, and uh, Daniel was able to see uh, see that damage along with the picture, so we used that information to um, fasten everything back down and seal it back down. All right, Bob, did you have a follow up? All right, and then we'll go to Chris. Uh, Bob Hawkers, Hawk Sports. Why did you go to Track House to work with Daniel? Um, so I had a I had a strong relationship with AJ at 
colleague. Um, I, I was at RCR before I left for colleague racing, and I kind of did some part-time races as an RCR employee for colleague. And um, I really enjoyed working with AJ, and when he went full-time, um, I, I was dead set that I would stay there. If he was still full-time in, in the cup car, there's a chance I'd still be there, but um, that didn't work out, and uh, I'm thankful that I had this opportunity to, to go there. I didn't really know Daniel too well before then, so I, I didn't know what I was getting into, but um, you know, after spending time, I'm, I'm definitely pleased where I ended up. All right, Chris, go Chris, ahead. Chris Knight, catchfans.com. Matt, congratulations on the win. This pivotal race when you come back here to Landmore Speedway in September. How much are you looking forward to that being the opening race of the playoffs, and how much different do you expect the track to be? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we, we were thrown a little bit off guard, to be honest, here. Um, even though it's a little bit colder than what it was in the summer race last year, we thought that the track was going to wear out a little bit more. So I might have come here with a car that, you know, had a bit uh, too much downforce and not trimmed out enough. Um, but when we come back, if it's hotter, I, I, you know, I expect it to be a little bit more of a handling race. So, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we have to change up our setup a little bit and make some different choices on our, on our body builds. And, uh, you know, the race might play out a little bit different, too, with a another summer beating down on this track. All right, Matt, congratulations again. Um, enjoy this one for a little bit, and we wish you the best of luck next week in Vegas. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and continue with our post-race media availability. We've now been joined by our race-winning team owner, Justin Marks, who's answering lots of congratulatory yeah, text messages. <laughs> you are fine. No worries at all. 133 <laughs> texts in four minutes. <laughs> um, Justin, first of all, congratulations. I know it's always a nice feeling when you can get it wins out of the way early in the season. Obviously, for the 99 team, um, who went winless last year, this means a lot to them. Talk a little bit about your perspective of just keeping that team focused and, and knowing that you know they could get a win once this season um, you know started. Yeah, I mean, we're, look, we, we Daniel was employee number four at Trackhouse, and um, you know he, he, we're huge fans of him and believers in his talent and ability, and um, you know believe that he can do these things, he can win these races. Uh, so we made a couple of changes during the off season, and uh, you know to be able to punch our ticket to the playoffs, you know. Week two uh, is a great feeling. Re I'm really, really happy for freeway insurance. I want to tell everybody, you know, I'm not going to go totally commercial here, but the thing is, is freeway insurance started as like as a PSA for Daniel, and then like they did one race, and then they did two or three races, and then this year they took a huge position with our team, and now they're, you know, in victory lane is an amazing um, story for how companies you know, can fall in love with this sport and invest in this sport. So, so that's an amazing thing. But for Daniel personally, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a great friend of mine and I'm a huge, huge believer in his talent and his ability and he's a big part of this track house family. And, you know, we, we, it's our job as a company to put the tools and resources and support around him so he can go out and do the things that he did tonight. So being in victory lane with him is, is a really, really special, um, I mean, you know, this, this, this was, I don't know if you could, if you could want anything more out of a NASCAR race than we saw tonight. I mean, it was an, un I was a, I was a complete race fan tonight. Um, and I was just hanging on to every lap and then you have the three wide finish. And I mean, just from an entertainment value, it was an incredible race. And then for Trackhouse and Daniel and Freeway to be the ones that came out on top, it's a little bit hard to find the words, but um, I'm just really, really proud of him and Matt and everybody on this 919 that worked so hard. Awesome. Well, congratulations again. We'll go now to questions from the media. We'll get as many questions in as we can. I'm going to start with Jordan here in the middle. Jordan Bianchi, The Athletic. Fair or not, the perception was that Daniel Suarez was on the hot seat because you look at the situation at Trackhouse with all the drivers and the number of seats. Is, was that a fair perception? And was Daniel, in a, in a year, even though he has a contract, having to perform 
this year to, to ensure that he was going to be continuing with the team? Um, I would say that there are a lot of things that happen in the in these businesses that nobody in this room knows about, and that and that means that that we are all working on business development and growth and opportunities in the future. So, you could look at what we have right now, and you can look at the the drivers that we've signed, but you don't know what we're working on behind the scenes. So yes, this is a contract year for Daniel. Does that mean that this is Daniel's audition? No. It means that that basically we are, you know, we're working on growing this company and making Trackhouse, you know, one of the the powerhouse, you know, perennial championship contending companies in this sport. Um, you know, on the hot seat. I mean, he just didn't have a he just didn't have the year that he wanted last year. But um, you know, but we know that he can get it done, and he's a guy that can get it done. So so I don't envision necessarily a situation where Daniel is not a driver for track house racing. There's a lot of things going on behind the scenes. And this is why we made a change at crew chief. This is why we made a change with the, with some of the people around him and the processes is to, is to put him in a position where he can win because track house is a winning company. And so, um, so I just, I, I would say that, you know, it's, it's validation for the work that we've done this off season to, um, you know, to be able to put him in a position where he can showcase his talent. We have a lot of exciting and important things happening for the future of this company. And um, I guess that's what I'll say about that. It's just nice to be in the playoffs in week two. You kind of touched on it a little bit, but what, I mean, I would imagine that this is, has to be a relief in some way, kind of a validation too of, like, hey, this is the guy we believe in, and now it's just not believing, it's actual tangible results to point to as you try to go forward. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know he's, you know, he's been fast in so many races. He's had bad luck. The team has made mistakes. I mean, there's there's just there's been some some issues the last couple of years that have that have prevented us from being in a position to be in victory lane with him. You know, you look tonight at I mean, you know, they come across the start finish line three wide and all three cars finish within eight inches or whatever. So it's not it's not like, you know, he's ten seconds ahead of the field or whatever, but like you have to put yourself in that position and he put himself in that position, made the right move at the right time to win the race. Um, you know, Daniel's my guy. I mean, I love Daniel, and, and he's got incredible talent, and he's a guy that just needs good people around him and a good process around him, and, and he can be very successful, so. All right, like we're going to continue with questions. Um, Bob, I believe you had a question. Uh, Bob Parker is Fox Sports. What do you feel like this does for Daniel as a driver, this isn't a road course win, it's an oval win, it puts him in the playoffs. What do you think it does for him, his confidence, and just what it could mean for the future? Well, yeah, I mean, the when I saw him in victory lane, the first thing he said to me is that th this is just the beginning, we're just getting started, we've got a lot of wins ahead of us. And I think that that's in indicative of his personality. I mean, Daniel goes to the racetrack and feels like he can win every race. He's been he's been so fast on the road courses that maybe he's he's sort of been put in this kind of silo where where people think that he's kind of like a road course guy or road course specialist, but he's very good at the super speedways. He's he's very fast and good at the one at the, at the 1.5s. You know, his his short track progression has been really really good. So I mean, I think, you know, you come to a race that's this tough. I mean, this is a really really tough race tonight. We had 12 or 13 leaders, you know, 25 plus lead changes. I mean, he, he had to make really good moves at the right point to be able to lead and put yourself in position in a race like this. So at this specific type of race for him to win, I think it's, uh, it really is great for his confidence because, um, because he's closed the deal, right? I mean, it's like he's had, you know, great races at Dover and, and great races at Pocono and some of these places that, that, you know, but then he wins at Sonoma and he almost wins at Indy last year. And he was super fast at Coda and all this stuff. Um, but, you know, come to a place like this that's, that's you know, pretty unique and, and very oval and drafting centric, obviously. And, and to close the deal, I think, I don't think it's confidence boosting. I think it's, it's more just, um, you know, he just, he just, he's like, I know I can do this. So it's nice to close the deal. All right, we're going to continue with questions. I believe Matt, you had a question. We'll go to Lee. Matt Weaver, Sports Not. I know you're kind of in the moment, and you're probably certainly biased towards being the winner here. But can a moment like this, a finish like this, big picture, be a catalyst for the sport in some way if packaged and presented the right way? Um, 
you're asking me that as, as a, is this a, is this a direction for the sport, this type of racing? No, no, just having the sort of fanfare and enthusiasm that people have, can this be broadcast to the masses oh, as yeah. a way to like grow the sport? Uh, th this, I think that the, from an entertainment value standpoint, I don't know what more you could want from a race like tonight. I mean, it was it was incredible. My my heart rate was you know 150 all you, just watching you know all, all race long. I talked to my wife about this. I was like, you know, the calmest people here are the guys driving the cars because we're all just watching this, just holding our breath. I mean, this is one of the most compelling races I think that you that you could want you know for for a sport. I mean, it, it was. It was an incredible thing to watch. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that that if we, if you're asking me about, you know, is this a product that we can, you know, promote to the world? Is that what you're saying? Like, well, just any time that you have like a really good finish, like 1979 Daytona, yeah. right? Like it, it, it becomes kind of a catalyst to create kind of more enthusiasm. This is not 79 Daytona, but. <laughs> On, on a scale. Yeah, for sure. We have to we have to promote events like this as aggressively as we can because you can't you can't want anything more than what we had tonight. I mean, that was an incredible finish, an incredible race start to finish, which is why I'm a huge advocate of this sport. It's why you know we're finding ways to to you know tap into the MotoGP program to promote you know NASCAR to the world because this is some of the best racing in the world. And um, you know, I just. Like I'm a race fan first and foremost, and I think this was this was everything you could ever want, you know, from a race. And then one mm. more for me: um, the the sheer number of like rival competitors and teammates that all came and visited Daniel and congratulated him. What is it about Daniel's personality that makes him so beloved and kind of rooted for in the sport? I mean, he's just a great human being, Matt. I mean, he's he's he is he's someone that that has he's got a great story. He's a guy, you know, like he moved he moved to America, didn't speak English, moved to Buffalo, New York, and watched cartoons to learn English. And and the story of uh, like you know moving from Monterey, Mexico, to America to try to be a NASCAR driver, like you know nobody does that, and everybody knows what his story is. And he's he's a great person, and he's always smiling, and he's happy, and he's genuinely passionate about being here. And so I think everybody kind of roots for him. And if you go back and watch the cool down lap at Sonoma in 2022 when he won that race, you see every single driver, you know, stops and drops their window net and and you know gives him a thumbs up and all that. I mean, he's a favorite because, you know. Because people just know how bad he wants it and how hard he works and how appreciative he is of being here. And so, you know, I think any time Daniel Suarez wins a NASCAR race, it's a popular win. Even, you know, the Mexico race at, um, um, in L.A. a few weeks ago, I mean, everybody's just excited about it because they just know how hard he's worked and the sacrifices that he's made to get here. And that's, that resonates with everybody. All right. We're going to continue with questions. We'll get a mic to Lee and then Cameron. Did you have a question? You're good. Okay. We'll go Lee and then Jacob. Go ahead, Lee. Lee Spencer, com. I talked to Ross in Victory Lane. I don't think he could have been happier if he had won himself. And he said having Daniel run the way he is and performing and just his work ethic propels Ross to be better. You feel like they just continue to push each other to elevate Trackhouse as a whole. We, I mean, this is one of the things that I love about what we do more than anything else is that is that we have a team where when whenever one of our guys wins, the other guy comes to victory lane genuinely genuinely excited for him. And that's the culture that we're building at Trackhouse is that we're we're truly a team and we support each other and we're happy for each other. When Daniel won at Sonoma, Ross, you know, got out of his car, changed clothes, 30 minutes later showed up in victory lane to take take a picture with Ross. And when Ross won at Phoenix last year, Daniel, you know, didn't have a great race, got out of his car, went went to the front straightaway and ate watermelon with Ross. And that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do at Trackhouse because I think it makes us strong as a team. We're in, we're in an era of the sport where I've said numerous times, this is about the people and the culture and, and you know, really trying to build a, a tight-knit team because, um, you know, we don't have the funding and we don't necessarily have all the engineering resources that some of the big teams do. So we really have to band together and work hard together. And um, so it makes me really happy to see the other guys show up in victory lane. And Ross showed up, took pictures at the trophy with Daniel and was, was excited about it. That's what brings me so much joy and, and, and um, 
Yeah, that's what brings me so much joy because I'm trying to build a team here where everybody's polling for everybody else. Um, and we're doing that. So, so thank you for that question because those are, those are the moments that are, that are really personally important for me. All right, we're gonna continue with questions. We'll go to Jacob. Go ahead, Jacob. Jacob, see one raised face digital, Justin, two for you over on your left here. Hi. Uh, <laughs> so first, kind of following up on what Bob asked earlier, I know you said, you know, it's not a case of, of Daniel being on the hot seat, but you got to see a rough year for him, obviously a lot deeper than any of us did. Did you see a point from him at all last year where you felt like maybe his confidence was shaking a little bit, or was this just a case of, of him really weathering the storm and knowing that he could still do this? Yeah, I mean, there, there, were, there were certainly certainly tough moments and tough conversations. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and that's, and that's kind of how the sausage is made. It's sort of like, you know, Monday through Wednesday when we're in the shop and nobody sees that stuff and we're in meetings together. And, you know, it's like, what do we need? What do we need? To, like, how, you know, how can we... How can we help you, Daniel, give you what you need, um, you know, to, to, to experience success on the racetrack? So, yeah, there were there were I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, he said, I got this the whole time through 2023. I mean, I think it was, you know, him coming to us and us coming to him going like, you know, everything is the same. You know, the resources, the support, the funding, everything is the same between the one and the 99. And when you see the one, you know, doing what Ross is doing and the 99, you know, not making the playoffs and being behind, that's, you know, that's all of us coming together and going to Daniel and saying like, like, what do you need? Like, how can we really work together um, to, to support you in, um, you know, with the elements that you need. So, yeah, there there were some some you know tough conversations. Um, I wouldn't say tough conversations. I would say, you know, f very focused conversations uh, about, you know, figuring out what 2024 looks like as a team, and um, you know, and we made some changes and and um, you know to, to show him and to give him you know the support that he needs to be successful because Trackhouse as a two car cup team is not successful if one team is good and the other team is not. Like, like it, it, we've always said from day one, Daniel's success is our success. So we have to, we have to, we have to give him the support. And, you know, it's not, it's not an emotional thing. It's just, it's a pragmatic thing. It's just, it, it's like tools and it's people and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, Travis Mack is, a, you know, is a huge part of our company and a dear friend of mine, an amazing human being. Um, and, you know, we just decided we needed a different type of, of crew chief for, for Daniel. And so it was very, very hard to make that change emotionally and personally. But um, but it was one that we felt like was necessary to um, you know to give Daniel you know what he said he needed. So um, so yeah, I mean I, I just I would say that that you know we're we're very very focused on uh, being a very strong team that's successful acro across both cars. Um, and you know he had a he had a you know a, a bit of a, a difficult year last year. So we re racked the deck and we worked really, really hard during the off season to give him an opportunity to, to get back to where we believe and we know he can be. And that's in victory lane, which we did tonight. And you talked earlier about building for the future. And I just wanted to get your perspective on this a little bit. You signed Zane end of last year for, for the deal. You signed Connor in January before the start of the season. You, where you are at Trackhouse as a team owner, having the perspective, having driven, you know, all the different types of vehicles that you have. What have you been scouting? What did you see in Zane and Connor that you liked, that you wanted to bring as far as bringing them into Trackhouse? Yeah, and SVG. I mean, we have, what, what, what's important to Trackhouse is humility, hard work, selflessness, and passion and desire. And, um, you know, we, we have a lot of very, very talented people at Trackhouse in engineering, like I said, it, in administration, shop staff, pit crews, you know, all of that. And, you know, the, these guys all represent the Trackhouse way. And, and they are they're people that just go, I don't, I don't care about the noise. I want to be a race car driver. I want to win in racing, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes and work hard and sacrifice to do that. And that, that's really that's the requirement to be on the driver roster at, at Trackhouse. And like I said, we've got big plans for growth in the future, and, and big plans for everybody that we've got under contract. And um, it's it's pretty simple. It's it's that you know love this sport more than anything in the world. 
um, leave no stone unturned and and work hard and dedicate yourself to uh, to being the best that you can be, and you've got a place in our company. All right, we're going to continue with questions. We're going to go to Stephen, and then we'll wrap with Chris. Stephen Toronto, CBS Sports. Justin, uh, you're the kind of person who appreciates moments and appreciates where they fit in the history of the sport. You were part of one of those two years ago at the Hail Melon at Martinsville, and that car is now sitting in your race shop as a display piece. Uh, you know, it might it may be a little early to suggest this, but is there any chance that you might try and preserve this car given its status as being the winner of one of the closest finishes in history? I mean, I, w I would say in, in, in the Gen 6 and previous, in, in the era of the sport before next gen, yeah, yeah, we we would do those types of things. But the thing is, is that, you know, we're in a new paradigm of the sport. We have a seven car car uh, maximum for how many v uh, chassis that we can own, and I'd really be be I would love to be able to do that for the fans. I'd love to be able to do that as a showcase. You know, we work with the Hall of Fame. But the fact of the matter is, is that you know we get seven chassis per team, so we got 14 cars in our shop, and. That car's pretty good, so I want to take it to Vegas. So, um, so yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't think that we're we're going to do that. I mean, that, that the car after the Hail Melon was was you know pretty hurt, pretty bent, and uh, you know we wanted to, we wanted to preserve that and show it for the fans. But um, you know, when you in this era of the sport, you know, under the 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 rules paradigm that we have right now, when you win a race with a car that was as good as the '99 was today. You know, I want to take that car to Vegas, and then I want to take it to Phoenix, and then I want to take it to Coda, and I want to go just win with it. Gotcha. Just making sure. Thanks, Justin. Yep, thanks. All right, Chris, we'll wrap with you. Chris Nightcatch, fans.com. Justin, two quick things. Uh, Zane You're my Spence. last interview tonight, and you know what? I think that you were the first interview I ever did in stock car racing at Kentucky and ARCA in 2005. Is that that's right? That's right. That's right. Okay. <laughs> that's a good thing, I finished right? like 38th. Yeah, that's okay, though. Okay. <laughs> Look where you are today, right? So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. I, for a I, know, I threw you off. That's okay. Um, Zane Smith, even under the Spire, Spire Motorsports camp, he's still a track house driver. Had a good showing last weekend in the Daytona 500. Was running strong here today. Yeah. Talking to him this weekend, he's very upbeat, very positive. Says he likes, enjoys being business meetings with track house meetings with Spire. Are you happy with the progression that you've seen from Saint Saint during the off season and his outlook on 2024? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, we're, it's so early in 24 right now. Just you know, and we've had two pretty unique races. But but the you know. We, we put Zane under contract, and then we really started to work with him and get to know him. He got in the sim. He got embedded in the shop with us, spent time with his crew chief, Stephen Doran, uh, over at Spire. You know, he had, a, he had a good race at Daytona, got a top 15 finish, and, and um, you know, he showed a lot of real speed tonight. He's got some good people around him. Um, so we're, you know, we're very excited about Zane and his future. I mean, he's, he's, he's the full package. I mean, he's marketable. He's intelligent. He's a great race car driver. He's a bulldog in the race car, but he's, um, you know, but he's a great, he's a great brand ambassador outside of the race car. So he kind of checks all the boxes for us. You know, it's really early in the season. We're only two races in, you know, I tell him, you know, I was like, look, you're, you're on a, you're on a multi-year contract with us. Um, you know, go run these races, get these experiences. He went to the outside to try to make it three wide tonight. I think he was one of the first guys to do it, to just shoot to the outside when, when guys were too wide and check that third lane out. Ross was the other one, of course. Um, but he, um, you know, I like that aggression and I like that learning and, and, you know, he's got a lot of experience ahead of him. He's got another 34 races ahead of him in this season. And, um, you know, I keep telling him this is, a, this is, there's not a lot of pressure on you right now. Just go, just go run the laps, experience, you know, a cup card, all these different types of races, but we're very bullish on his future and we're really proud to have him, uh, a part of track house. We're all big fans of Zane. We think, we think he's got a lot of exciting things ahead of him. Thanks. And then uh, on the flip side, during the off season, there was a lot of discussion with the Xfinity team owners and executives that they felt like in the truck series and Xfinity series particularly, where they felt like that they had to embed the track house model, thinking outside the box and bring different things into their programs in order to entice sponsorships and just put their team on the radar. Does that give you, I don't know, a good vibe to know that other teams are seeing what you're doing in the cup series and feeling like that they need to adjust their organization for the current metrics in the sport to make their programs, you know, um, more prof or more, you know, attractive. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a big opportunity in this sport. I have a certain belief about what's 
possible in this sport. And it's just the way that I do things. And, and you know, Ty Norris over there says there's, there's no pride in authorship. And so it's like, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't feel like it's ours. I think, I think it's an important role for us to experiment and to get creative and unique and, and um, try to do things that are different. Because what we're doing is not something to try to make ourselves feel happy. It's something that we're doing because we feel like the sport has a huge opportunity. And, um, you know, we want to be the people that, that come in and, and try to do different things. It's something is just simple as a screen or just, you know, LED screen, like whatever it is. But we're constantly, t- I mean, I'd send, I'd send Ty text messages like at 10 o'clock at night when I'm sitting there in my creative mode and he's probably asleep or he's having dinner with his wife or whatever. And I go, what about this? What about that? What about this? And that's just, that's kind of how we think. So, you know, I mean, this is, this is a sport that needs big brands and it, and it needs teams that are, um, motivated to, um, to be ambassadors of an entertainment property and to give the fans something to get excited about, and you know, if we're if we're leaders in that, then then great. I mean, we're kind of sort of doing our thing, but we, but there's this is an ama- this is this is an amazing sport, and more people need to um, to see it, and so we feel like we're ambassadors of that. So, I'm gonna shut up because Daniel Suarez is in the room and he won the race. No one wants to hear from me anymore. <laughs> Congratulations, Justin. Thank you for spending time with us tonight.